cloud. Let's just start the YouTube stream. Okay. Okay. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, it's probably, I think it's the same, probably the same group from yesterday. Uh, but still, I would uh, do the very short introduction. Um, so hello, good morning. Uh, this is, a, again, a course on 12 link of uh, dependent origination as part of the Buddhism from A to Z program. Uh, so I'll just remind a few things. Uh, first of all, this and all the other classes uh, of today are being streamed live on YouTube. Uh, so you can watch them as, as well as previous uh, recordings. Uh, I will uh, advise, ask if you can please uh, uh, turn on your camera so we can have like a real feeling of a class. We can all see each other. The teacher can see us. Um, the material or the text for this course is, uh, first of all, I will uh, send it here in chat. And you can also find it uh, in the Dharma Friends of Israel, uh, in Dharma Friends of Israel webpage. If you go to the page of this event at the bottom in the text, you can find uh, you can find the, the twelve links uh, text. It contains the chapter on dependent origination from the fundamental wisdom of Nagarjuna and, and some uh, uh, commentary. Um, and in the, the same page, the page of the event on the uh, Dharma Friends uh, website, in the middle, you can find the donation uh, box, the Dana box. I remind you, this is uh, all of the uh, Dharma Friends activities are done by volunteers um, and are supported only by donation. So if you want to, most importantly, practice generosity uh, and also donate, for the continuation of our activities and support us and the teacher. Uh, you can uh, do it by either PayPal or uh, by bank transfer. And uh, I will also send this on the chat. Okay. So I think that's about it. So um, with this, I will hand us over to Geshema, thank you very much for teaching us today, and okay. you can take it. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's start uh, again as usual with uh, some breathing meditation. Then I'll guide you through a short visualization as well as setting your motivation. Um, and then we'll do a few prayers, it's just as yesterday. Okay, so let's start with some breathing meditation. So now in the space in front of you, 
Visualize the embodiment of all positive qualities such as wisdom, great compassion, bodhicitta, appearing in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni, who is inseparable from your Lama, and who embodies those qualities that you already have in the form of a potential. And the Buddha appears in the form of a fully ordained monk wearing saffron robes seated in the full lotus position And then visualize that you're surrounded by all sentient beings. Appearing in different forms, but nonetheless experiencing Similarly, experiencing all kinds of suffering, fear, confusion, sadness, worry, physical pain. and uncontrollably experiencing over and over birth, sickness, aging, and death. So let's generate sincere compassion for all these sentient beings through generating affection and the wish may they all be free from their sufferings, from their wrong views, their limitations. And may I be able to bring this about. In particular, since all their problems and limitations were caused by their ignorance or misapprehension of reality, may I be able to lead them to a state in which they have totally removed that misapprehension.
since I can do that only if I reach the enlightened state of a Buddha. Generate the determination. I will do whatever I can to reach the enlightened state of a Buddha for the welfare of all these sentient beings. However long it takes to reach that state. And however hard it's going to be to reach that goal. And may us learning about the 12 links become one of the causes of our future enlightenment. And now with this sincere motivation, let's cite the prayers. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the positive accumulation I gather by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the positive accumulation I gather by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the positive accumulation I gather by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. And in order to effectively do this, now focusing on sentient beings, May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends, and hatred for enemies. Okay. Great. Um, let me just check what's in there. So you're always welcome to add questions to the chat. Um, if you've got any in order for you not to forget them while I'm talking and then I'll try to answer those questions. All right, so we continue with the 12 links. Um, you'll notice that I'll spend a lot of time talking about the first three and then also link 
8, 9, and 10, because they're most important. The understanding of those is most important, but of course, I also explain the other ones. But to say a little bit about how to apply the Dharma, I've already said that. I keep saying, well, bring the Dharma into your own life, which is another way of saying you learn to see your own life through the glasses of the Dharma, if you like, through the lenses of the Dharma. Now, on hearing this for the first time, that sounds dangerously sectarian-like, possibly. Like in a sect, if you follow some kind of, uh, well, a kind of uh, weird sect, well, usually there's a lot of brainwashing taking place so that through this brainwashing, you see the world through the lens of the views of this particular sect. Um, now, the difference here is, of course, you should not take on anything unless you've analyzed it really well and you come to the conclusion, this makes sense to me. So whatever you learn, of course, it's extremely important that you analyze it. But for that, you need to listen. And to listen, what's important before you, well, to get the information is to listen to it with a beginner's mind. You probably heard this expression from the, from, the, from the Zen tradition. You know this from the Zen tradition. There's a lot of emphasis on doing things with a beginner's mind. And that's such a beautiful attitude because oftentimes when we've heard the words of some explanation on the Dharma or anything else, we've heard it before, our mind goes on to some kind of, well, uh, some kind of modus of not really listening as of, well, I know this, what comes next? I guess we take on this kind of mind that wants to be entertained. Um, for the very first time, yeah, there's interest. We want to hear, we want to understand what, what the, the teaching is about. But anything, we listen to it for the second or third time, well, things change. Therefore, and I've stressed this yesterday, it's extremely important to listen as if you heard it for the first time, but also to not just look at it as some kind of theory, but to analyze right away, check, does this accord with your own life? Does this make sense with regard to the situation you're in right now? The situation you're in right now is unique. It's not the same as yesterday. It's not the same as last week our mind and body, in particular our body, my own mind, changes all the time. And external situations change all the time. Therefore, the situation, the state of mind you're in right now, as similar as it seems to before, it's different. Which is why, take what you hear and listen to it, well, with your heart. It's a kind of, it's kind of a hazy way of talking, but in the sense to apply it to your own life with this analytical kind of attitude in an analytical way. And if this makes personally sense to you, well, then you apply it to your own life and that you bring it into your own life on a daily basis and start seeing ideas such as, well, the 12 links in your daily life, which takes me to the 12 links. Parts of the 12 links are difficult to recognize. This is what Dharma practice is all about, recognize these ideas in your own life. So what's the first link? Ignorance, misapprehension of reality. Now, before we met the Dharma, I'm sure we were aware of the fact we are wrong with regard to different things. There are optical illusions. We perceive colors in a certain way due to the, well, background of that presents itself when we see the colors or so their optical illusions. Um, there are other types of illusions, possibly of, of an audio type and so forth. And of course, we are wrong about certain situations. Therefore, I guess to a certain degree, we're aware of our misperception of reality. However, with regard to the basic misapprehension, which refers to how phenomena exist in terms of being independent, interdependent, not existing in and of themselves, being a reflection of our own mind, in other words. 
phenomena, whatever appears to you, only appears to your mind. It doesn't appear to your neighbor's mind, doesn't appear to your friend's mind. It's different. You have a different perspective. You have a different cultural, well, cultural background, not necessarily, but still come from a different family. Your life is very unique to everyone else's and how you see things not everyone well no one else sees things in that exact same way because no one else has exactly the same history as you do being part of this family being sister brother number one or child number one two or three whatever born first second etc so it's totally unique so just from that perspective even without talking on a deeper level your daily experiences your daily appearances to your mind what you think about what you reflect upon is totally unique now that already gives you that already indicates that there's nothing objective that you perceive is not objective just because you call something a table and I call it a table that does not suggest we see the same thing just because we call it the same thing but going even deeper, going even deeper, that object, such as a table or anything else, it seems that there is this object that we call a table because it is a table. It seems it's already a table. And that's why we call it that. But actually, on, on, a, on, a, on, on a deeper level than the fact that everything is subjective, going even deeper, that object, the table, is only a table because we call it that. It only appears as a table because we've labeled it that way. And that labeling that we that happens well has taken place in, in previous lives and it continues to happen uh, when we're born. I mean, labeling doesn't necessarily mean learning language. It's important to understand it doesn't just refer to using certain words in a certain language to now refer to this object as a table. Labeling means the moment you have a thought, it is this. And it doesn't need to be referred to by a word. It could just be this image you have of it, some general image. If you think of the ocean right now, there is a, a representation of the ocean, or if you think of the sea right now, there is a representation of the sea appearing to your mind. And through this representation, you think about the sea. And that process of thinking about the sea, that is what Buddhists call labeling. You have a certain way of looking at the sea. There's a representation, whatever appears to your mind when you think of the sea, is unique to your mind. And through this appearance of the sea to your mind, you label, you perceive it, you apprehend it in a specific way, which is unique to your mind, and it means you label. And you do that with regard to yourself. Most importantly, when you look at yourself in contrast to everyone else, there's no sense I'm just labeling I on the basis of this mind and body and other on the basis of others' mind and body. No, it seems that you apply this term or you apply this idea of I to yourself because this is really an I. There's something very concrete here that's called an I that is concretely different from everyone else. But actually, as I said, on the deepest level, what happens is based on lots of other facts, lots of factors which are not the eye, the body, certain states of mind, certain mental events, interactions with other people. Based on that, we just label I. We have the thought I. And other than that thought I, there's no I to be found. There's no I to be found. There's nothing to be found that can be called I, which we can easily find when we look for an I, if we search for it. If we were to label I only because there wasn't a real I, we call it I, we speak of I because there was one, a self that is not just labeled, that's not just called I on the basis of a mind, mental events, body, and so forth then we should be able we would be able to find it 
it'll be it would it would the more we look for it the clearer it would have to appear to our mind but is it the opposite is the case the more we search for it if we don't really look for it something is clearly appearing when we check out this appearance this appearance of something solidly it appears to us as if there was the solid eye when we look for that there's no way we, we find it there's no way we can find this solid kind of eye and the same, of course, applies to the mental events, the body. Again, those based on which I label the eye. Well, if I take one of those objects, I let go of the eye. Now I check, is there a solid body? Is there something solidly there that I call the body? If I search for that, again, there's nothing solidly there. The body is merely labeled on the basis of parts that are not the body hand, an arm, a finger, certain functions that the conventional, what we call the body, performs. And based on that, if I look for it, I don't find a body, but it's based on those parts, I just call it the body. I label it. And my thoughts, the thoughts I have, these ever-present thoughts, thinking this is this, this is that. I mean, we inter interpret every situation in life, our interactions with other people, while, while they take place, our mind is constantly, the mental consciousness is constantly interpreting. This person says this, this person said that, this is how I respond, this is my, and so forth. So we're reinforcing all the time this labeling, this I'm like this, this person is like that. And we continuously create this world around us, which is fine. This is how the mind works. And this, these conventions, this is this, this is that, we create, as I like to call it, like a collage of me in the world and other people in the world, but we don't realize that this collage is not really out there, it's not something that exists in and of itself, and we just recognize it, but rather it's an expression of our mind, it's a creation of our own mind, and if we look for that, somewhere within the objects based on which we create this clash, we won't find it. Now that in itself, of course, is not a problem. This is not a problem in that if that was all there was, not a big issue. It's called a misapprehension in that I believe that which my mind creates actually exists that way. And my mind only perceives it because it exists that way. I don't realize my mind creates it. And therefore, we can say, well, on the based on that creation, which is consistent, this exists. Conventionally, it exists as being consistently created by my mind. In that way, it exists, but it doesn't exist in and of itself, independent of that kind of creation, if you like. Now, as I said, if it was just that, that wouldn't be a problem. But... This misapprehension leads to emotions that create actions which are harmful. Which are harmful? Well, harmful in the sense that they give rise to something our mind just doesn't want. Our mind doesn't want. If our mind wanted it, well, we would embrace the misapprehension. The Buddha was, would embrace the misapprehension because the misapprehension leads to emotions which in turn lead to certain experiences which we called suffering but if we liked suffering the buddha would have encouraged us to generate this misapprehension but in fact what we don't like is to feel miserable to to be unhappy to experience fear we don't like these emotions and what gives rise to these emotions well the misapprehension of reality at first because what does it do it mainly focuses on the eye why? Because the mind, it's the mind that does that. It labels I on the basis of this mind and, of course, the body that goes along with it, right? That's like kind of I. There's, there's a lot less of a, of a focus on the mind. In fact, that's how a lot of people nowadays can get away with believing there is no mind. There are some people who believe there's only the brain. Although the function of the mind is not the same as the function of the brain. So, therefore, the mind is less our focus 
as in like there's less emphasis on my mind, my mind. There's much more focus on that which we label on the basis of the mind, which is the I. Also on the basis of the body, but actually more importantly on the mind, labeling I. And since that I is close to this mind labeling, there's a sense, okay, there is I and everything else is sort of removed from that I. Only because that's part of this labeling process, I'm I'm um, um, categorizing, I'm classifying objects to make sense of them, okay, from the point of view of appearance. However, now I believe these objects to be truly distant to me. So this is I, and everything that is not I seems to be totally distant, totally distant from me, okay? So everything that I not, don't associate with the I, so other people and so forth. And I create a distance that is just created by the mind as if there was an independent other. And because there's this I that suddenly seems so isolated on its own, I create strong attachment to it. This is more precious. I hold on to it. This I is more precious. It's just created by the mind. And this distance to everything else is just created. But nonetheless, I'm not aware of that. So even though that's just a creation by the mind, not being aware of that, I now hold on to this. I hold on to it. And I consider this to be more important. And since the mind wants to be happy, wants to be peaceful, wants to be satisfied, this, which I call happiness, the happiness of this I is now more important because I'm attached to this I. That is more important than others. Now, this type of attachment to I and mine, in particular, my happiness, my well-being, that is called the self-cherishing attitude or self-centeredness, to use another word. So you can see how this misapprehension with regard to all phenomena, but in particular with regard to the I, gives rise to attachment to the I, attachment to my happiness. And that then further, so really the root is this misapprehension. The second step is attachment to the I. That's the second step, the second kind of state of mind. And then that... Now, out of this attachment to I and my happiness, I look around in the world and now I seek, I look for this happiness. I don't find it with myself. Why? Because the moment there's attachment to the self, there's worry, there's fear. Attachment always comes along with fear, a sense of something is going to happen. Maybe it's already there. My self is in danger. Or if it's not in danger, the fear that something could happen to it. As long as soon as there is attachment by its nature, there's always fear. There's always fear. Even something hasn't happened yet, but a fear that it may take place, that the eye, someone could harm me, could harm my reputation, could harm, I don't know, my possessions, my pleasure, whatever. So therefore, within myself, since I don't have, since I have that misapprehension of reality, I cannot find happiness and satisfaction. So naturally, where am I going to look for happiness and satisfaction? Outside of myself. And when I associate with other objects, and because of this association with other objects, there's a feeling of pleasure. Now I label pleasure on that object based on how I feel. But as before, actually, I'm just labeled on the basis of something that is not the pleasure itself, which is the object, based on, for instance, my feeling, feeling of pleasure when I'm with this object. So now, based on that, I label pleasure on the object and then believe there's pleasure is in the object. The pleasure is in this object. It's Inside, it's intrinsic to this object. And now I want it. I want the object. I don't want to be separated to it. 
And I'm attached. I'm attached to so many things. I'm attached to this object and that object. I'm sometimes, if I associate it with myself, I can even get attached to disease. I can get attachment to problems. So it's not just I'm attached to objects that I believe give me pleasure. Anything that associate with myself. So my problem, my even those things I get attached to. It's just this this basic action of the mind to be attached, to right away hold on to something. Based, of course, based, of course, of this basic attachment to the I. Based on this, this attachment that's the underlying afflictive emotion that follows right from the misperception that is the total root. So misperception giving rise to attachment to the self and then attachment to all sorts of other things. However, I don't just remain with attachment. It's not just that it's the only afflictive emotion I have, although that is kind of more of an underlying emotion. No, then there are other ones, such as anger, when something threatens what is mine, what is I and my happiness. Then I get angry, uh, resentful. I have aversion towards an object. I develop spite, different types of emotions that are part of the anger category if you like where i dislike something i want to harm something i want to be away from something and of course and that's another aspect that's another aspect that is very well let's get to that in a moment so the, so there's anger then there's jealousy jealousy or envy envy is probably a better word uh, jealousy and envy are sometimes used interchangeably, but really a better term is envy. Envy is also a type of resentment. It's a type of anger, which is I don't like another person for having something I'm attached to. So envy is if my neighbor's got a big, bigger car, a kind of car that I'd like to buy, but I don't have the money to buy. To, to to pursue. So then I get angry. I resent my neighbor for having it. It's a type of anger. And of course, I'm attached to the car. So it's like two in one. Ang envy is like two in one. Then there's arrogance. Arrogance. I feel full of myself. I think I'm better than others. Now, there's a whole, whole, there are different, there, there's a whole, um, what do you call it? Like a, uh, a huge, mass of different emotions which I can all recognize in my own life so as part of bringing the life the dharma into your own life of course analyze be critical do I is there something like jealousy is there something like attachment and so forth when it makes sense to you and you recognize this in one moment or a second moment well then look for it in each moment go through your own life and check that our own lives are governed by these emotions. There's attachment to the I, number one. The afflictive emotion, number well, the root affliction, which is the misperception of reality, this we can find in our own life. Do things appear to us in a way as if there was, like there's a table that exists in and of itself. There's an I that seems to just be there. And I only call it the I because, because it's already there and so forth. And then check how deep is the sense I? How worried are we about the I? How quickly are we worried about the I? Is there always a sense of, sense of impending danger? Like we always, we, we can never really be relaxed because there's always fear with regard to the I. And then of course, anger, attachment, spite, resentment, are these there? Of course they are there. Okay, so this we can actually easily can easily observe this. This is not a big secret. It's not totally hidden to us. Very important, that aspect. But one aspect that is also important, that these emotions are not in accordance with reality. They have no grounding in reality. So homeless stresses this a lot. In what sense? Well, the misapprehension, the root misapprehension is pretty clear that it's not in accordance with reality because the way things appear to us, appear to that mind, impossible. If we apply in intelligence or wisdom, if we apply anal analysis, honest, impartial analysis, we'll find none of these appearances are in accordance with reality, number one. But if you then take the attachment to the self, 
the way the attachment perceives its object, this imagined kind of self, that's also not in accordance with reality because it totally exaggerates the importance of this self. It exaggerates. It adds an importance and a precious or important, well, a preciousness to this I that it actually doesn't have. And the same is true to the objects we are attached to, the external objects. If we are attached to another person, the moment we are attached to them, or even before that, before the attachment sets in, our mind has already exaggerated the greatness of this person, the goodness of this person, the good qualities of this person. We see them very differently to everyone else, which was not the case when we first met them. We're never attached to someone right away. It is in relation to when we're around them, the way we feel. It's again, how does this mind that holds on to an eye, how that feels? If it feels good, if there's, or if that mind itself doesn't feel that good, but other minds that this self grasping mind, the self cherishing mind, I should say, the self cherishing mind, it observes a sense of happiness that takes place that, that other types of mind that are with this continuum of the past and other types of mind experience. And of course, right away, it labels over there. Okay, there's a process of labeling. Uh, oh, this person is positive. They make me feel good. There are these thoughts. There's just these thoughts, these natural thoughts. But then these labeling thoughts that take place, the self-cherishing mind is not able to distinguish. It's not able to distinguish, oh, these are just labeled. These are just thoughts. No, there's a sense there are these thoughts because the object is really wonderful and it really brings out my best nature and so forth. And those thoughts, they exaggerate the good qualities in this other person and we are attached. When we're angry, the opposite happens. The negative qualities of this person, whatever, when we're angry with a person, usually it's a person when we're angry with someone, the negative qualities are exaggerated. They're exaggerated. And then we see them as totally negative. We just want to be away from them. We want to harm them possibly. And if not that, we just want to be away from them. We don't want to think about them. There's resentment in that case. And again, it's just an exaggeration. When there's a resentment comes down, when the anger goes down, when it's gone, we see this person differently. So it's the anger that the lens of the anger, the lens of the anger makes this person or whatever is the object of our anger appear in a really terrible negative way. And out of that exaggerated way, we act in a way that's exaggerated. And this exaggerated way that is described as, ne well, it's a harmful exaggeration, exaggeration of a harmful action, a harmful action, negative action, which leads to which, which every time we perform these negative actions, these actions that are exaggerated, why? Because the emotion that gave rise to it is exaggerated and that leaves an imprint which gives rise to an exaggerated experience which is suffering. Exaggerated experience which is suffering. Suffering. Exaggerated which means we add more to it which is, act well, exaggerated has different connotations here but in terms of the action it is not in accordance with reality. It's it's again a harmful action. We harm another person, not to discipline them, to help them, which would be a balance. If someone does something wrong, we may actually say this is not all right. So this is not an exaggerated action, but because of the anger, there is an there is an extra kind of way in which we act. And that, of course, every action leaves something behind. With every action, there's a reaction. And so eventually it comes back to us, but it comes back to us in an experience of suffering. Now, when I say every action leads to a reaction, um, well, it, there's a bit of this because that's like one of the Newton laws, laws of nature, every action leads to a reaction. And I know there's a criticism saying, well, this is with regard to physical objects. There are physical objects, like when you shoot a gun, and the gun recoils, there's an action and a reaction. So people criticize this, physicists, they criticize this, they say, well, you can't apply this to the human mind, to behavior and so forth. But I disagree. I disagree. I believe that 
the, the laws of nature that you find in the external world in terms of physical objects, you find these workings also with regard to the mind. Take the law of cause and effect. The law of cause and effect, you'll find that also with regard to the mind. There are causes that lead to certain results. Our mind only works on the basis of causes. A result only takes place if a cause happened early on. So just the way we, we study, for instance, we only gain knowledge if there's the causal procedure of study. And likewise, I believe that every action we perform, whatever we do, first of all, it doesn't go unnoticed, as in like it doesn't just disappear. No, it leaves something on the mind. And sooner or later, something comes back as a reaction, as in like, well, right away, people possibly react to what we do. But even further than that, even over a longer time, it eventually comes back to us in the form of an experience. And that which we don't like, our suffering experiences, they come, they're an exaggerated experience, such since it's, it's not balanced, we experience this as something unwanted. And therefore, unwanted is that which we want to get rid of, but we need to identify the causes of it. We usually identify the causes for that suffering. We blame other people for it and destroy them. We believe getting rid of them possibly destroying them or maybe just avoiding them well that is the, the 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 way to remove our suffering but of course it's not these other people are just cooperative conditions but the main causes are found well with our actions the actions we accumulate in the past which go back to the emotions the afflictive emotions that gave rise to them with all the afflictive emotions, well, as, as of attachment being the root of anger, all the other afflictive emotions, uh, such as anger, jealousy, and so forth, the root of those is attachment. The root of all attachment is attachment to the I, and the root of that is the basic misapprehension of reality. In other words, ignorance. That is what we need to remove. So it comes down to that. And what happens this exact process okay so first there's this basic misapprehension that leads to attachment first of all attachment to the eye and other other objects and that then causes us to act to have certain thoughts that for instance plan to harm someone as one example um, verbal actions uh, physical actions and because nothing gets lost, well, these actions leave something behind on our own mind. These actions are called karmic actions. And what they leave behind is a karmic residue or a, an imprint, if you like. Again, with the misapprehension and everything in between, we can observe this. It's not hidden to us. We can actually observe it based on our own mind. Now, what about these imprints? That's the second aspect. What about these imprints? Can I observe these imprints? Very difficult. Very difficult. But in a way, there's something we can do. And I already mentioned it briefly yesterday. We can observe something that's called habit. In fact, we, we humans or living beings in general, well, ordinary beings like ourselves, are described as creatures of habit. Our whole life is very much influenced by habits. There are very, a lot of neutral habits. When you make your breakfast in the morning, you know your own fridge, you know where the bread is, you know you're doing these actions, you're going through actions, doing things on autopilot, which is just another way of saying you're so habituated to them <clears throat> that you do them automatically. It's a habit. If you're in another person's house, and you make your breakfast, you try to make your breakfast the way you usually do, can't do it because you haven't developed that habit yet. And a habit is a process. It takes time to develop it. Okay. Now, how do you develop a habit? It, the, the process of developing a habit, it's a, mainly it's a mental process. You cannot develop a habit unless you had a mind. 
a corpse doesn't develop habits. A, a, a table doesn't develop habits. So what develops habits? It's the mind. There's always a mental process that takes place. Even when you're an autopilot, there is a mental process because if you were unconscious, you couldn't drive a car. So if you're an autopilot, like you drive a car, you, 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 you know exactly how to drive it through the force of habit. It's really habits that allow you to drive a car uh, while having an argument maybe with the person next to you. Now, you couldn't do that if you were unconscious. If the, wake and the, the mind that is awake weren't active. Why? Because these habits still, it's because of habits left on the mind, but the mind still needs to be actively there, that type of awakened mind. And these habits are imprints left in the mind. The mind, when you do something for the first time, is very different. Governing your actions of body and speech is very different to the mind that does something for the second or third time. When the attentiveness doesn't have to be there to the same degree, the this, this same kind of, well, um, mindfulness doesn't have to be there, should be there, would be great if it was there, but doesn't have to be there. So we can daydream, etc. Therefore, this, this happening, when you really get to understand that part of the mind, that nature of the mind, you come to recognize the imprints or you come to well it's less of a recognizing as like oh look there's a little imprint but rather this function of the mind that there's something left on the mind every time you perform an action there's something left in the mind that next time makes it easier to perform that action and that is called a habit and this is the name, therefore, this habit is given the name of an imprint. This is what we call an imprint. There's something left on the mind every time. So it's not like a little actual imprint indentioned into your mind or a seed, which in our mind, just because we use the word seed, a seed appears and we create this image that in the mind there are little seeds. Now, that is that's just an analogy. It's just an analogy to think of the mind as having something left, as something being left in the mind every time we have the thought. And we use the word seed, but don't think it's literally a seed, like a, like a seed that gives rise to a seedling or a plant. It's only a name. It's only labeled on something left in the mind that makes that habit possible. Okay, so if you observe habit, habits in your own mind, you're basically observing this function of the mind of leaving something behind, a residue, which one of its function is to create habits. But another of its function is to create experiences. And from that point of view, we call that residue not ha habitual seat, a seat of habits, but we give it a different name. Based on that, it's, a, it's the same basis, but from the point of view of a different function, right? That's very natural. You can take a person performing the function of a cook, you call them a cook. Performing the function of a teacher, you call them a teacher. The basis is that person. Likewise, the residue left on the mind, every thought you think, every idea you have, it leaves a residue. And one of the functions of this residue is to form a habit. Okay, you do it once, you do it twice, and it becomes a habit. The other function of it is to create experiences in the future. From that point of view, you call it a karmic residue or a karmic seat. It's a different function that this residue performs. And that, I believe, is this reaction, as in like whatever you give out comes back. You give something out, you shoot a gun, and it recoils. That's an immediate response. With here, with this, with this idea of, of, of leaving a karmic imprint that has the function of causing experiences, there is time in between. It, there's time in between. As in like the idea what goes around comes around. It takes a while. It doesn't, it's not immediate. There are immediate responses, but they're not karmic. They're not the karmic result of that particular karmic seat. There are caused by that karmic seat, but they're the karmic result of a different karmic seat. The karmic seat, for instance, if I, if I 
if I shout at someone, if I shout at someone right now and the other person shouting back at me, usually there can be some exceptions, but usually me shouting at this person and the other person shouting back, me shouting at another person, this is a karmic seat, which usually takes time to grow into a response, a karmic response in the form of another person, let's say, shouting back at me. It takes time. Now, this other person shouting back at me is not the karmic result of that shouting, but it's a result of it. As in like this, this karmic, this shouting at this person, okay? This is a cause that made the other person respond in that way. But the other person only responds in that way because in the past, sometime, I created a karmic seed that now accounts for being shouted at. Okay, so this is a further complication with regard to karma, where karmic seeds take a while. They're left on the mind and the immediate responses that come from, for instance, shouting at someone are usually not the karmic results of that action. They're just a result of that action created by a karmic seed sometime in the back, in the past, which because this complication makes it so hard for us to believe in karma. Why? This extra kind of nature. Why? Because we don't always perceive that every action has a consequence. If I shout at someone right now and the other person doesn't shout back and there's nothing coming back, I believe, no, not every negative action. If, if my, my shouting at the person comes out of a motivation to harm them, making that a harmful action, I now believe, well, because the other person doesn't call, shout back right away, I find it really difficult to believe that every karmic cause has a result. I'm not aware. So this is why people get away with robbing a bank, robbing other people if they're powerful and so forth, and they do horrible actions. Sometimes the response is they are imprisoned and they receive their punishment. And in that way, I have a sense, okay, there is a karmic result. But no, that is not the karmic result of that karmic action. It takes time. And if there's no response such that the other person gets punished, I believe karma doesn't work. This is the difficulty with karma. It oftentimes takes lifetimes. It takes lifetimes for it to come back. A karmic residue is left on the mind. Some can right away lead to karmic experiences, but most don't. It takes lifetimes. Now, only if I consider many, many lifetimes, then I can see whichever action I accumulate, sooner or later it comes back. That may take a few lifetimes. And in particular, when it comes to actions that we are discussing here, actions that are so powerful that they, that these actions, they're so powerful that they lead to a new rebirth, that they cause another rebirth. And those are the actions we're interested in here. Now, I've given you a lot of explanation here, but I felt it was necessary to fill in some, some of the details just because it may be just an abstract idea that doesn't make sense to you. So for us to make sense of cause and effect, which karma is a part of, but in particular of the fact that a action leaves something behind that from the point of view of its experience, of, from its function, leads to a certain experience. And that experience can be another rebirth, experiencing another rebirth in samsara, in the existence we're in right now, or it can just lead to an experience of having a conversation with someone, being shouted at, uh, being stroked, being treated well, being treated badly. All of this left as a result of these karmic seats that, seats that perform these particular functions. Now, we are interested here, of course, in those seats, as I said, those seats that are left on the mind which are so powerful that they cause rebirth. Powerfully positive 
or powerfully negative. There is no powerful neutral action. Why? Because any powerful positive or powerful neg negative action needs to have a powerful emotion preceding it. So a negative action that's powerfully negative would be strong hatred, for instance. Although influenced, well, definitely influenced by ignorance. But then there are also powerfully, powerful positive actions that are positive, such as great love, out of great love, saving another person's life, for instance. So the wish for another person to be happy. It's still influenced by this misapprehension of reality. And of course, there's attachment to the I here. But nonetheless, there was a moment of love for that person, wanting to be benefit this person, and that made us save this person's life. That's a powerful, positive action. It leaves something behind, a karmic seed, and that can potentially give rise to a positive rebirth. Okay, now those more powerful karmic actions of body, speech, or mind, virtues or non-virtues, or the powerful ones are either virtues or non-virtues. There are no neutral powerful, these type of powerful actions, they're called projecting, projecting karma, as in they either project a positive rebirth in one of the higher states, or a negative rebirth in one of the lower states, just from the point of view of the experience, having more suffering, having more happiness, we distinguish between higher rebirth and lower rebirth. Okay. So having said this, now, the question arises, and that takes us to the same links, but now you notice, what you'll notice is I, I, the order is now different. I will not now go along these 12 links the way I described it, because I find it necessary to explain a slightly different order here. Now, what, and I'll come to the order the way it's traditionally described, but allow for me to say to say this, like what happens to the seed? How can I make the seed ripen? How can I, what can I do when the seed lies in my mental continuum, a particular seed? I follow the seed and at some point it ripens. What does it need to ripen? Is there anything it needs? Absolutely. Just as when you have a seed in, in nature, and here again, there's some similarity to external objects, such as the seed in nature. You need other, other than the seed, you need other causes that allow for the seed to ripen. We all know this, when you're a gardener, just a seed in itself is not enough. You need to put water, you need a certain temperature, you need some light. Only then, or I don't know, light not initially, but for the seed to ripen into a sprout, you need certain conditions. Definitely a certain temperature, water, and possibly, well, yeah, a certain fertilizer. fertilizer. Similar, similar, if you've left a karmic seed on your mental continuum, you need attachment. For this seed to ripen, you need attachment. You need attachment and a stronger form of attachment is grasping, even stronger than, so attachment is like not being able to let go. Grasping is really holding on to the object. So attachment, grasping, those are afflictive emotions. Grasping is just a stronger version of attachment. Without those, the seed, this karmic seed cannot ripen. It cannot ripen. Why? Because this karmic seed was only left because there was, well, the misapprehension of reality, but of course also attachment to the eye. The attachment to the eye was there. Without attachment to the eye, no karmic seed that is karmic seed that is caused by ignorance can ripen. Cannot. If you now, if you now, in particular, well, I should say in particular, the karmic seeds that cause rebirth. In particular, the karmic seeds that cause rebirth. Now, they definitely cannot ripen because they're very powerful. Those ones cannot ripen without attachment. The other ones, mm, certain ones still can if they're related to the body, but not, if, not to the mind. 
karmic seeds that are related to the mind can also no longer. So you can no longer have mental suffering. In other words, if you remove attachment by removing ignorance, you can no longer have mental suffering. Only physical suffering like pain can still be experienced. But of course, the mind doesn't suffer. Mind doesn't suffer. Okay. Now, with regard to karmic seeds that were left that project you into a next life, for them, you need attachment, definitely attachment. Because your mind, what it does is death. In Buddhism, death is only the separation of your mind from your body. Death is just the process of this mind separating from this body. Right now, your mind and your body are intimately linked. Your mind is, if you want to ask where it's situated, well, it's it's based on very subtle energy. And this energy is situated in this body. It can go actually outside of your body. The energy can go outside of your body slightly. So therefore, actually, mental events can also slightly leave your body. But in terms of we but we don't perceive it that way of course we don't see things from the point of view of our elbow for instance why not because of course we need the sense perception it's only through the senses that we can perceive things around us however if you wonder where's the mind located within your body well all over because the energy is all over your body it seems the mind is up here in the brain that's just because we're so used to it or in the in the in the heart but this is only where the subtle mind is located, not the coarser minds that are active right now. But when we die, what happens? The connection between mind and body is severed. And now all these coarser minds, they, they come together. They come together and they all kind of absorb, if you like, into the subtle mind. And only a very subtle mind that's at your heart center, the center of your chest, it comes together there with all the energy and then this subtle mind leaves the body and you're reborn in a different place but only when well you're reborn why because just before death you experience strong attachment we always do we always experience this type of attachment because there's a feeling of course a lot of people know they're dying. They're, they're, they know they're dying. I mean, people who die slowly, they usually know. I've just been in two cases. I was there uh, when people were dying, elderly people, they were dying. And both, they knew it. They knew it. Um, anyway, no, no need to talk about why. But um, in both cases, they knew it. And before long, when this process, when really mind and body separate because of our attachment to the eye and to the body, therefore, that which is mine, there's always a moment of attachment and strong grasping. And therefore, in that moment, automatically, that type of grasping you experience at the time of death is strong enough to then lead to the ripening of a seed left on your mind. And that seed that seed is then responsible for where you're reborn. If you didn't have that attachment, you didn't have that grasping, you would continue to exist, but you wouldn't be thrown into a samsaric reborn, rebirth. The word throw, I'm using this word throw, because when you throw something, the object that is thrown has no control. And this is the same here. That's why this karma, we describe this karma that we left in the beginning on the mind, which is now ripening in the form of a rebirth, we call it throwing karma or projecting karma. Throwing in the sense there's no control. We're just thrown wherever this karma takes us. And that's why we say birth is suffering. Birth is suffering because birth is not the moment you 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 grow, you come out of your mother's womb. That is also, of course, the suffering definitely for mother and child. But it's also the process of being newly conceived somewhere. No one has asked you. No one has asked you. Do you want to go there? You want to be reborn there? No. We are uncontrollably thrown into a new existence, and that's why it's 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 suffering because there's no control. There's no freedom. There's no freedom. That's why we talk so much about liberation as opposed to 
being not liberated, having no freedom in terms of what happens to us on the daily basis, but even from the beginning, from the point of view of the beginning of this lifetime, where we're thrown to, just anywhere, we could be thrown anywhere. Okay, now, this part, before we start to meditate, I've, I've talked for a long time, um, I hope I didn't tire you, but I wanted to explain you just this process, and everything else will make more sense then. We have a misapprehension of reality. That leads to attachment, I, attachment to I and mine. That leads to attachment to other things. And that leads to actions of body, speech, and mind, which, like anything, leaves something behind, leaves something behind in our mind. And if it's a powerful virtues or powerful non-virtues, that is positive or negative action, left on our mind, then I call that, that is then from the point of view of its function called throwing karma or projecting karma because it has the function to project us into a certain rebirth and how does this seed when can it ripen it ripens only at the time of death it could be at the time of death of this life or any other life depending on how we die so we have left many, many different imprints on our mind, many different ones, virtuous one, non-virtuous ones, powerful virtuous ones, powerful non-virtuous ones. And many of those we've accumulated left on the mind. And when we die, depending on our state of mind at the time of death, a powerful virtuous one can ripen or a powerful negative one can ripen. But it will ripen because there's attachment and grasping to the eye. I. I want to exist. There's this feeling things are dissolving. I'm going out of existence and I'm holding on to the eye. I. I want to exist. When this process of death, when our mind is basically dissolving, the mind becomes subtler and subtler, the energy becomes subtler and subtler, we get a sense we're disappearing. And we hold on to, so strong holding on to it. Even if we die peacefully, it'll be there sooner or later. There'll be a strong holding on to it, just out of habit. Habit, again, left there or being, being possible to, habit being, being there, functioning there because of the holding on to a self in the first, first case, attachment to the self because of the misapprehension. Therefore, a karma ripens. And we're thrown somewhere in a, in a good state, in a state we would like, or in a state where, which we wouldn't like if someone had asked us or something we wouldn't prefer because there's just potentially more suffering, less freedom. That's the process. This is the basic, this is the basics, the basic working of the 12 links. So this I'd like to do a meditation on. Um, one, one request, please check whether your microphone is muted or not. Please mute your microphone because in the past um, there were some noises. So especially when mine is not muted and yours is neither. So there may be some, some sounds, some unwanted sounds. All right. So now let's take a moment just to calm down, to let go of any disruptive thoughts. We'll do some breathing meditation and then I'll guide you through what I just talked about in the form of an analytical meditation.
Now take a moment to become aware of your own sense of reality. When thinking of how things appear to you, can you recognize a sense that there's this objective world around you? That we perceive the way it is. The sense that we call a table a table because it is one. And we refer to ourself as I. Because there is a solid I. Just as we perceive an objective world, we perceive of an objective eye. leading to self-centeredness or self-cherishing, which is the word used to refer to attachment to the I. And to that which is mine. In particular, my happiness. Attachment to the eyes state of mind that considers the I and my happiness to be more important and is therefore unable to let go of I and my happiness. Can you recognize that within yourself? And then this attachment to I leads to attachment towards other things.
other people. Attachment to reputation. To gain. To pleasant experiences. To being praised. being successful which in turn then gives rise to anger, resentment envy, jealousy, and so forth, all arising from different types of attachment. But mainly due to attachment to the eye. And all these different emotions then cause us to act. To mentally plan. To be motivated, to motivate an action and then verbally and physically to engage in those actions. In that way, performing actions of body, speech, and mind. But since they arise from the mind, They leave something behind. They leave behind imprints. which depending on their functions are described as that which forms habits and from the point of view of the function of creating experiences are called karmic seeds And unless these comic seeds are removed, someone's got their microphone on. Can you please switch off your microphone? So unless these imprints are removed, through purification, or in the case
case of virtuous ones through anger, they will remain on the mind. And it's their nature that if they're very powerfully virtuous or powerfully non-virtuous, they have the potential to throw us into a, a higher or a lower state of rebirth. but only if at the time of death we have not yet reached liberation. That is, only if we haven't removed our misapprehension of reality yet. accounting for attachment to the eye. Because of the process of death, of the coarser mind becoming more and more subtle, At some point, there'll be strong grasping at the eye. First attachment, and then even stronger, strong grasping at eye. And that then causes the ripening of such a throwing karmic seat. Throwing us into higher or lower rebirth. Depending on which karmic seed ripen first. And now to conclude this meditation, spend a moment just focusing on whichever insight whichever insight you've reached through your analysis and single-pointedly Focus your mind on that insight.
Now there's no need to do the dedication because we've got only a short break. It's 10.30 now. No, where you are, it's 11.30. Um, or wherever you are, I don't know what the time is, but we've got half an hour. Am I right? We'll have half an hour of a break. Okay, so you yes. have the opportunity to yeah take a rest and I'll see you again in half an hour. Okay, and please, we're still within the 12 links. Okay, so don't let go of the 12 links. The way you go about it now is just watch your own mind in terms of attachment to the self, giving rise to other afflictive emotions, to just be aware uh, how emotions, how attachment arises in particular. Okay, great. So see you in half an hour. Okay.